So today we come to the epic conclusion of chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. And so let us remember all that we've discovered so far in this amazing chapter. So it begins as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He heading back to Jerusalem for a feast. During this time, he enters in and he goes to this area that is a pool. And at this particular pool, he sees a whole bunch of people that are called invalids, or we could also look at invalids. These are people who are lame, who are blind, who are diseased and sick. These are these type of people that we find in this area by this pool. And what does Jesus do? He picks out a man who has been an invalid for 38 years, someone who had been lame and not able to move for 38 years. And what does Jesus do? He goes over to him and he heals him. Jesus displays his power and his glory to his disciples and to all those who are near into that person. And he tells that man to pick up his bed and walk. And he does. And this is incredible. But what happens next is not incredible. The religious leaders of the Jews sees the man walking with his bed and rebukes the man. What are you doing walking on the Sabbath with your bed? He tells them that he's doing what the man who just healed him told him to do. Well, who healed him? This is shocking. The man didn't even know. The man who was just healed didn't even know who healed him. And the Jewish religious leaders were angry. Why? Because they just found out that someone was going around breaking their law. God's law says that no one should work on the Sabbath. And to help the people from breaking this law, the Jewish religious leaders created 39 categories that would help them from breaking those laws. And what happened? is this man and this healer broke those 39 man-made laws. The Jews demanded to know who did this. And so the man ends up going to the temple, and while he's at the temple, guess who finds him? Jesus finds him. And so Jesus finds the man who he'd heal. He's like, look, you are well, you are healed. And so what does this man do? turns right back around and heads back to the Jewish religious leaders to rat out Jesus. Hey, I know who that guy is. I know his name now. His name is Jesus. What? What? You just got healed, and now you're turning around, and you're basically tattletaling on the person that just healed you. The Jews get their posse together, and they head out to find who Jesus is and confront Jesus about his law-breaking healing on the Sabbath. And that's when this epic showdown begins. So the debate begins, and Jesus, during this debate, blows their minds. Jesus confirms his deity. He confirms his equality with the Father. And did the Jews accept this? No. No, they did not. And Jesus proceeds then to bring forth three witnesses that confirm who he says he is. And we looked at these three witnesses last week. First, Jesus points to John the Baptist who confirmed that Jesus was the Jewish long-awaited Messiah. Next, Jesus points to the Father who he is carrying out the will of the Father. And how is he doing it? Through the signs and wonders that he is currently performing that will lead to the ultimate sign of resurrection. And then lastly, Jesus points to the scriptures which anticipate his coming. That is chapter 5 thus far. And that leads us now to verse 40 through 47. Will the religious leaders come to Jesus? Will they recognize that the one John pointed to was indeed the Messiah? Will they acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God carrying out the Father's plan? Will they see the one that scriptures anticipate is now standing before them in their presence? Well, let's go ahead and open our Bibles or turn them on if that is your preference to the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 40. And Jesus answers our question by saying these words, Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. No, the answer is no. They do not confess Jesus as the promised Christ. They do not confess Jesus as their Savior. 
And we have to ask ourselves, what is it going to take? What is it going to take for someone to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the anointed one, he is the prophet, the chosen one, the one that has come to rescue, to redeem, to ransom, to restore. What is it going to take? Jesus points out that they refuse to come to him so that they may have life. And the apostle John records these words from Jesus specifically because it's from these words that his entire gospel is shaped. The entire purpose of this book that we're journeying through is shaped by these words. It's not only key for religious leaders, but those words are also key for each and every one of us. Not only for us here at C3, but for every person here locally and every person abroad globally. These words are important. And let's see them once again uh, as we look at the fullness of this gospel. John chapter 20, verse 30, we'll have this up on the screen. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but hear this this morning, verse 31. Now, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, Jesus is recounting this very scene that we're looking at for the very purpose and hopes that you will turn to Jesus. This scene, this gospel, this book that is found in your Bible is written for the singular purpose that you would see, that you would hear, that you would believe, and that you would turn to Jesus. There is life in no other name. There is life in no other way. There is life in no other pursuit, and there is life in no other person. Later on, we'll see these famous words from Jesus driving the point home, and we'll look at it today on the screen. John chapter 14, verse 6. It doesn't get any clearer than this. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, as you've heard me say, is not a way. Jesus is the way. But we hear this all the time. If Jesus works for you, great. That's awesome. Jesus works for you, awesome. But something else works for me? Well, if that's the case, that's great too. Let's celebrate that you found your way, I have found my way, and let's just be thankful that we've all found our purpose and our meaning and our hope. That's what our culture and our society says. But if we're truly understanding what Jesus is saying, we can't celebrate. Matter of fact, we must mourn, we must plead, and we must proclaim. Jesus is our only hope in this life and the next. Jesus is our only hope in dealing with the sin that separates us from the Father. Jesus is the hope. Therefore, the greatest tragedy that is happening is that these religious leaders are standing before the one that they have been studying about, the one that they have been anticipating, the one that they have been reading from Moses himself that has been foretelling that this is the one that would come to rescue, redeem, ransom, and restore. This is him, and he's standing right before them. He's standing in their presence. This should also be a dire warning to us as well. What do I mean by that? Listen, if these religious leaders who study and dedicate their lives to God can be blinded, then so can we we too can be blinded to the truth. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we are blinded because of our rebellion and our sin. And so here we have from the studied religious leaders all the way to say even like the people who are homeless on 192. It doesn't matter whatever uh, gambit that we want to try to cross. It doesn't matter from the least of these to the greatest of these. We all need Jesus. Jesus is the answer, not just for the religious leaders, but for you. And Jesus is the answer for me as well. But before we move on, I do want to point out something pretty radical. This is incredible. These were not average town folk that were confronting Jesus. This was not an angry mob that was confronting Jesus. This was not just some group that were on a Saturday night looking to cause some trouble, rolling up on Jesus to, to go ahead and, and make fun of somebody. That was not who this is. These are studied, learned, trained leaders of God's word. Like these are the elites of God's word of those days. 
man by the name of D.A. Carson is a biblical theologian. He made this connection. He says this, if therefore some of the Jews refuse to come to Jesus for life, that refusal constitutes evidence that they were not reading their scriptures as it was meant to be read. That is a tragedy. These are the people that should know God's word. These are the people that you are expecting to be able to teach the oracles of God. But here's the purpose, and this is what we must hear today. The central purpose of all of scripture is Jesus. From the very beginning, from Genesis, all, actually even from Genesis 3.15, when sin enters in the world, we see a redeemer that is going to come and crush the head of the snake. From the very beginning, we see that there is going to be one coming. Moses tells of the prophet that should be listened to. All the way through, we see over and over and over that there is somebody that we are anticipating. And here, we find that person that has been anticipating. But the religious leaders miss this. And if I miss this, if you miss this, then we miss the whole purpose of why we have our Bible in our hands. Like the whole reason that God's word has been preserved from the time it was written through now is the point to this man. And here, these religious leaders were in front of him. But when we make the Bible out to be anything other than Jesus, we've missed the point. Matter of fact, people are gathering in churches all across this country and even all across this world to open up this book, but they'll open it up for many different reasons. Some will open it up as a self-help book, as a way to live their best life, as a way to understand how they can be a better person or how they can get ahead in life. And they'll, they'll open up this book for that reason. The Jewish leaders were opening up this book because they believed if they studied it, they would have life because they studied it. The more that they studied God's word, the more that they would have life. Missing out on the whole purpose of studying the book was so that they would see who was standing before them at that particular moment. So, hear me this morning. The scriptures do not save you. The scriptures point to the one who does save you. Scripture is the whole reason we're reading it. Now, now hear me this morning. Don't confuse. Here at Confessors of Christ Church, obviously, if you've been around us, we elevate Scripture as high as we possibly can, but we must not miss out. The reason we elevate Scripture as high as we possibly do is because these Scriptures point us to our Redeemer. These Scriptures point us to the one that can give us life everlasting. So let's continue now that as we go to verses 41 and 42. Jesus continues by saying these words, I do not receive glory from people. This is Jesus speaking, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. These are very harsh and direct words. Jesus is calling out these studied men of God and says, you do not have the love of God in you. You may think you do, you may act like you do, but you don't love God. And Jesus has the authority to say these exact words. Now, if we remember back in chapter 2, Jesus says something that really makes no sense. Like, we, we have a hard time grasping. Like, Jesus, why would you say this? Why would you do this? Let's just look at it real quick. John chapter 2, verse 24. It says this, But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them. These are the people who were seeing his miracles uh, during the time that he was at Jerusalem earlier. And why does he say that? Because he knew all people, verse 25, and needed no one to bear witness about man. Why? For he himself knew what was in man. Jesus himself, get this, did not entrust himself into these people who were there awed in wonder of the signs and wonders. He didn't trust them because why? Because he knew what was in man. He knew what their heart was, and he knew that they weren't believing for the reasons that they were called to believe. Later we'll see, uh, I think next week even, that there's, Jesus is going to feed the multitude. And later on we'll find out that he rebukes them because he's like, you're just here following me because you got your, your fill of food. But you're not following me for the life that I am given. So Jesus being the very essence, the very being of God, knows each person fully and completely. And this is why Jesus can say what he said about them. We can make judgments on people. Maybe we're right. Maybe we're wrong. 
we can look across and we can look each other and we can say, hey, because of this, I think this about you. Because of that, I think this is who you are. And maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. But maybe you're wrong. But Jesus, Jesus is never wrong. Jesus knows the heart. He knows the mind. He knows the person. Jesus doesn't have to guess. And so it's important to note this. You can do religious things. You can go to religious events. You can even be a part of a good church and even hear biblical preaching, yet the love of God may still not be within you. You can fool your family. You can fool your friends. You can fool this congregation. You can even fool me, let's be honest. I've been fooled many times already. But you cannot fool God. You see, your goal should not be getting the approval of me. Your goal shouldn't be getting the approval of your spouse, the approval of your kids, the approval of your boss. That is not your goal. Your goal is the approval of God himself. That is your approval. That is what you should be looking for. However, they're proving that they do not know God or love God because if they would love God, they would love the Son. Scripture is clear about that. If you want to love God, then you must love the Son. If you do not love the Son, then you do not love the Father. Instead, what are they doing? The unthinkable. They're persecuting him. The creator of the universe. They're persecuting. So let's tie in uh, what Jesus is saying, that he doesn't receive glory from people. Let's tie that in after reading these next two verses. Let's go to verse 43 and 44. Verse 43 says this. I have come in my father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. Verse 44. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. These are striking words, bringing forward the reason and the cause for their unbelief. You want to know why they're unbelievers right now? Here it is. They are more focused on the glory from other people than they are from God. They seek man's approval and praise. They want to be adored. They want to be loved. They want to be respected. They want to be lifted up by man. They seek the glory of created beings instead of seeking the glory of a creator. That right there will preach to most of us, especially me especially me, like we are constantly looking for other people's approval. Matter of fact, our entire society is built up on this. And know what we're seeking approval of now more than anybody else? Ourself. What? Like we can't, we figured out that we can't get approval from parents because maybe you had a bad relationship growing up or we can't get the approval that we need from our spouse because things aren't working out and that's difficult. And we can't get approval from our job because they don't know what they have and our value and worth. So what are we told to do? We're told to get the approval from ourself. But we fail ourselves. How often do we fail ourselves? Like we can't even get that right. We can't even... Even though we desire everything about ourselves, we want to do everything, we fail ourselves. I fail getting up in the morning. Like, I wake up and I look at my phone, it's 9 a.m. It's like, no, there's no good reason to get out of bed this morning. Like, why? And it's like, but no, I got to. I got to get up. We got to go. We got to do what God has called me to do. And so we look to all these things as for what we're supposed to do, and we realize that is going to fail us. And so we seek the glory of ourselves. We seek the glory from others. And we're thinking that that is going to sustain us. Let me tell you this morning, that doesn't sustain us. We are not to seek the glory from one another. We're not to seek the accolades and praise that come from that. We are to seek the glory that comes from the creator, the glory from God. Jesus displays his purpose and goal and thus our purpose and our goal. Jesus is coming in the Father's name, seeking not their glory, but the Father's glory. And we too are called to not seek our own glory or glory from others, but we are to seek God's glory. It's for God's glory and our good. Amen. We too here are to represent Sola Deo Gloria was the battle cry of the Reformation. What is that? It's for God's glory alone. 
That is what we're called to do. It's for God's glory alone. Jesus was not the first, though, we, who claimed to be the Messiah. He was not the first person that said, oh, I'm the Messiah. They had others before. But listen to this. The past people who claimed to be Messiah turned out to be frauds because all they were trying to do was make a name for themselves. They were pandering to the Pharisees. They were pandering to the crowd, lavishing praise upon the religious leaders. Why? Because if the religious leaders put their seal of approval on that person, then guess what? Then they're good. If they can get the approval of man, then they can do anything and everything they want. But this is what's so radical about Jesus. Jesus doesn't need your approval. Jesus doesn't need you to accept him. Jesus doesn't need anything from you, actually. You need everything from him. You need everything from him. Now, please don't hear me that that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love and care. And it, Jesus is going to go to the cross for you. Do you understand? He is going to go to the cross for you. He loves you dearly, passionately, to the point of death. But he is doing that for your good and his glory. His goodness is displayed by laying his life down for us. They needed the approval of man to be successful, but not Jesus. Jesus needed only the approval of the Father. How different would our lives be if we lived to that end? If you were not looking for the approval of anybody else except the Father. You weren't looking for the approval of anybody else except that which is of God. How would that change our pursuits? How would that change how we live? That doesn't mean we don't stop doing what we do. It doesn't mean we don't go to work the next morning. It doesn't mean that we don't uh, be what we are called. No, we be that person, but instead of looking for man's praise, we're looking, God, how do I glorify you today? How do I honor you today? How do I live the life that you've called me to live, and how do I make much of Jesus in this day? And let me tell you, you don't have to stand up here behind a music stand to do that. You can do that in your job. You can do that in your home. You can do that with your kids. You can do that with your relationships. You can honor God by going out to eat. You can honor God by playing basketball and dancing. You can honor God in many other ways. However you do it, what does it say? Whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, that's what we're called to do. But many of us, including myself, I'm putting myself here, struggle with the approval of man. And we're missing out on our purpose and putting incredible stress on ourselves when we look to man instead of looking to God. Friends make an awful God. Families make an awful God. Spouses make an awful God. God does not place a burden upon us that we cannot bear. But God relieves us from the burden of our failures and frees us to a life of purpose and fulfillment. A lot of people says, well, I can't even measure up to what my kids think I should be or what my spouse thinks I should be or what my boss thinks I should be or what even I think I should be. How on earth am I going to level up to what God thinks I should be? That could be a crushing burden for you this morning. But this is the amazing gospel that it's because of everything God is that you have been set free, not because of what you did. It's not about you. Matter of fact, if it was up to you, you would fail. You would have nothing to set before a holy and righteous God, but because of him, to his glory, to his honor, he has done what only he can do. So guess what? You are free. You are free to now follow, to pursue, to love, and to be what God has called us to be. This purpose is not found in man, but only in God. This fulfillment is not found in any job or activity outside of God. Jesus points out the reason for their blindness. It now points to the results of their blindness. Let's see that in verse 45. Verse 45 says this, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. What? What? What, what does this mean? Moses brought the law. The law was not meant to be the end all of religious life. But the law was meant to point us to Jesus, a need for Jesus. They looked to Moses. These are the religious leaders. Look to Moses as their mediator between God and them and hope that Moses would be their answer. And what is going to be mind-blowing for them is that the one whom they've set their hope on, the religious leader setting their hope upon Moses, is going to be the one who accuses them. 
wow. Now, will this actually be judgment in heaven? Theologians seem to be split on this, and I don't think it really matters too much because I don't believe that's particularly the point. I tend to take the stance that Jesus is referring to the Torah and the first five books of the Bible that were written and what Moses had wrote as the accusation. But what is not up for debate is this, that they are judged. They're not hearing and listening to Moses. His words serve as the basis of the accusation that will be brought before these religious leaders. Now, let me give you, let me tell you what this is. Moses clearly spoke of the future Messiah in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Let's look at that verse together. The Lord, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And the Old Testament is pointing to one that you should listen to. Moses is telling his people, listen. He is telling the Jews, listen to this person. Yet they're clearly not listening and they're rejecting Jesus. They're not only rejecting Jesus, but they're now seeking to kill Jesus. And there is no excuse because earlier in chapter 1, the Pharisees asked John this very question. If you've been journeying with us, you may remember this. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 21. So these are the religious leaders coming out to John. And they asked John, what then? Are you Elijah? John says, I am not. He says, are you the prophet? And he answers, no. Now hold on here. Isn't John the last of the Old Testament prophets? Isn't John our last prophet? Why would he say no? Because he knew what they were talking about. They were asking about the prophet that Moses spoke about. He was asking, are you not a prophet? Are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? And John rightfully answers, no. And so these religious leaders believe in Moses. They claim to follow the teachings of Moses. Yet the whole purpose of what Moses was pointing to before them is rejected by them. Let's turn now to our final two verses, verse 46 and 47. Let's see how chapter 5 concludes. Verse 46 through 47 says this, For if you believed Moses, this is Jesus still speaking, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? They put their hope in Moses, yet Moses pointed to Jesus, and Jesus is standing right here before him, and they reject Jesus. They, can't, they claim to believe Moses, they believe his writing, and Jesus is now calling them out. If you believed Moses, which you claim to, which you're saying you do, then you would believe me. Because all the scriptures from Moses on speak about me. Believe is actually a key word here. Let's jump back to D.A. Carson. He states that John uses believe as this, a right understanding and a hearty obedience. What does it mean to believe? If you believe that Jesus is a Messiah, he is the Messiah, then you would have a right understanding and a hearty obedience. Thus, we better understand that problem. They have a wrong understanding which results in a wrong obedience. They are looking to scripture for life when it is not found in scripture. It is found in Jesus which scripture points to. They are following the law in hopes of gaining man's approval all the while missing God's approval and God's glory. We remember the famous verse, John three sixteen: Whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. Who is those who believe, those who have a right understanding of their Savior, those who joyfully follow and obey with gladness? How many people believe in following Jesus as a burden, as, a, as it will set, sometimes called a yoke around your neck, a millstone around you as you're trying to follow? It's a great burden to try to follow Jesus. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says actually the opposite of that. So who is those who believe? Those who have a right understanding of the Savior. Those who joyfully follow and obey with gladness. So remember, so that we're not confused, it's not works that save us. But it's the belief and the obedience that shows the world that we have been saved. So it's not works that are going to save you. But it is our belief and obedience that showcases our salvation. So what did we discover today? Jesus is who Moses pointed to. 
Jesus is who Moses pointed to. Jesus is actually the better Moses. Where Moses failed, guess what? Jesus didn't fail. Jesus succeeded. Jesus has accomplished salvation. Jesus has accomplished eternity. That is why he can say, believe in me and I will give you life. We must not make the mistake that the religious leaders did. There's three specific areas we saw today. So let's just recap this as we close. We must not miss the purpose of scriptures. What are the purpose of scriptures? Know this this morning. Hear this. Embed this in your mind. The purpose of the scriptures is the point to Jesus. So whether you're reading the Old Testament or the New Testament, see how does this point us to the need of a Savior? How does this point us to our Savior? Secondly, we must not seek man's glory over God's. This is what the religious leaders were doing, and they missed Jesus. Please don't miss Jesus because you're looking to man's approval over God's. And three, we must not put our hopes on any person, not even the greatest man, men of God. We should not put our hopes in Moses, but our hopes should be grounded and rooted in Christ. So where does this scripture find you today? Are you looking for salvation in all the wrong places? Are you even looking for salvation? Do you even think you need salvation? Why do you read your Bible? Do you read your Bible for the praise of man? Are you looking for someone to think, oh, what a great person because he carries his Bible around. Oh, he must be somebody good. Are you looking for man's glory? Do you read it to feel good about yourself? Do you read it in hopes of getting what you want as thinking maybe God is a genie and if you just read some of the scriptures, maybe he'll give you your your, your desires? We see where the religious leaders went wrong. But have you tested yourself? Are you searching wrongly? Could you possibly missing out on your calling and the purpose of your life because you're too concerned with pleasing man instead of pleasing God? Is your goal to hear well done, good and faithful one by the one who created you or well done by a boss, a spouse or parents? Now, don't get me wrong. Part of our goal in living out the new life in Christ is being a witness to others through our God-glorifying actions. So that's not wrong to want to. Matter of fact, that's what we're called to do. But are you doing what you are doing for God or for yourself? Are you looking to boost your ego or your pocketbook or your status? Or are you making your goal to make much of Jesus through your life? And lastly, is your belief placed in man or is it placed in God? No matter how great or amazing person you are, you fail. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if we look to other people. You can look to Moses. You can look to Billy Graham. You can look to me. Uh, That would be Moses, Billy Graham, and then below the floor for me. But you can look to these people as that is your hope and you're looking in the wrong place. Don't look to fallen and broken people living in a fallen and broken world. Look to the one who's overcome the world. Look to the one who has saved the world. Look to the one who has redeemed the world, who cannot and will not fail. That is who we look to. John wrote this down so that you would see, hear, and know that Jesus is the Christ and thus believe. This is chapter 5. What an incredible scene that has been set before us. This is just chapter 5, and we've got so much more to go. But these are written so that you may believe. Believe in Jesus. Put your hope in Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. Rest your life in Jesus. Chapter 5 was written so that you may believe. Believe in him today. I mean that. Believe in him. Put your faith and trust in him and him alone. Amen. Let's pray.